Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. I want to invite you to join me in the Apostles' Creed as it's found in our, our bulletin this morning. And I would simply want to remind you that this is not something we say from rote memorization. This is not something that, that we confess lightly. This is the most significant, substantial, historic confession of our faith that's to be found in Christendom. So I would simply remind you that this is something we don't take lightly as we confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Anytime you, uh, you get the opportunity to... to to preach your last word somewhere it's a it's kind of a mixed blessing it's a blessing to know that that people think you're you're equipped and, and capable enough with the word that they would let you speak but they also uh, it's difficult because you've got to discern what it is that God would have you say in the last assembly that that we would have together and uh, for those of you who have ever been to my office you realize a that it's a train wreck and that B um, I keep a lot of toys around because students who, who tend to be nervous about speaking to people, sometimes when they've got something to play with, um, it makes it a little easier to talk. And I was sitting there this week and, and was trying to figure out what it is that, that I was supposed to bring about this morning. And I uh, was playing with a toy and I remembered this. Um, I mean, it's, it's not a, a memory of when I was real old. I think I was about three or four which would put that about 1975 or 76. I have all my life loved Play-Doh. I don't know if any of y'all are Play-Doh fans or not. Um, I'm sure some of you hate Play-Doh because you've done, had people do things like I used to do with Play-Doh to you, like right on the walls of your white home with it. Um, but when I was three or four, I remember two things distinctly. Um, my mom finally got some new carpet. And in 1975, it was that high-end carpet that had the, the sculptures within it. They had taken it, I guess, I don't know if they shaved it to make it look this way, but there were patches in it that were cut into a design that were a discernible difference in height from everything around it. So you could look, and it looked like a design had been made into the carpet. Well, if you looked at it close enough, it kind of looked like waves. Um, the way that the cut was made and how it flipped. You got to remember, this is the middle 70s, so it would fit with the times. But uh, 
I remember thinking, you know, the only problem with this brand new carpet is that they aren't blue because the waves are blue. And so I took a uh, big clump of Play-Doh. And uh, as my mom came around the corner and saw me molding this into the shape of the waves on her brand new carpet, um, and maybe for the first time figured out that, that it's not always great to be an artist. Um, it, it sometimes comes at a cost. And, uh, you know, I, I've had a lifelong love affair with Play-Doh because it's just fun. It, it's a stress reliever. They've actually done scientific studies that, that say the average person who spends 20 minutes a day playing with Play-Doh their blood pressure will decrease by 20% over the course of the next year. It's such a good gift. But I wish that, uh, I wish that we were just talking about Plato today. Instead, we're talking about the passage from Jeremiah 18. About how God has called Jeremiah to go to the potter's house. And as he approaches, he realizes the potter's in the middle of throwing a, a, a pot on the wheel. I don't know if any of y'all are into ceramics or, or anything of that flavor, um, but one of my dear friends in high school and college um, named Jenny Thomas actually graduated from the University of Mississippi with a, a Bachelor in Fine Arts as a ceramics major. And so I had her explain to me kind of what the whole process was. And uh, evidently it's kind of like golf. If you're going to throw pots, you better be able to cuss pretty well because it's frustrating. Um, because she would take this raw lump of clay and she'd set it on the wheel and she'd get it spinning, she'd get it spinning, and she's shaping this with her hands. And as she shapes this thing with her hands, she has no idea what's going to come out like in the final product. She's just kind of going by faith and feel that it's, it's going to come out right. And, and as she presses and as she moves her hands and, and as she would dig her fingers in in particular ways, a pattern would begin to emerge and, and a shape would begin to form. And, and several times I had the privilege to watch her make incredibly beautiful pieces of art. I mean, art that, that sold for money. But probably 50 times I had the, the amusing privilege of watching her get so frustrated that she would slap this big chunk of clay off, off the wheel into the wall. And, and it's funny because the wall beside the, the, the wheel in the kiln, I mean, it looked like it had been hit with a paintball gun. It was beat to death. There were probably 5,000 splatters from where all these artists in the, in the ceramics program at the University of Mississippi just lost their cool on the clay because it wasn't doing what they wanted it. Can I tell you that, that I had an epiphany this week? And the epiphany is this, that, that God has called us to be perfect clay. But too many times, instead of being perfect clay, I want to be like the potter. I don't want to sit still. I don't want to be obedient. I don't want to submit myself to the hands of the master potter. Instead, I want to create. And I want to control. I want to shape things. I want to have an influence. I want to have my voice heard. And I think it's probably one of the greater problems in the American church today. That, that we have forgotten what it is to submit ourselves to the Lord Jesus. And I realize that, that submission is a dirty word in our culture. Hear me, I, I'm not talking about gender roles, and I'm not talking about um, women's rights, and I'm not talking about anything of that except this. That right relationship with the Lord means that each one of us, male, female, black, white, rich, poor, whatever your demographic, right relationship entails that we recognize our brokenness. That we recognize our need and that in recognizing our brokenness and our need, we come to Jesus looking for healing and restoration, wholeness. And, and, and hear me, we don't find it instantaneously. We don't. We can see it in Him, but we don't get to experience it for ourselves in the blink of an eye. But what we do get to do 
it is enter into this kind of a, a tug of war, a, 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 a relationship that's sustained through some tension. And, and not necessarily tension in the negative light, but tension in the sense that it keeps us from falling apart. It holds us together. It holds us up. Because just like the, just like the clay, you know, the, the clay isn't soft. The clay isn't easy. The clay isn't weak. Because if it were, it wouldn't be any good for what its purposes were. If clay were as, as loose as water, you could never make a pot out of it. Instead, it's firm. It has resistance. It has some structure and some stuff. Because it has to be able to hold a shape. It has to be able to take a set. It has to be able to fi be fired. So that it's got a purpose that's in line with what God wanted to accomplish with it. And I want to let you know that you're in the same boat as the clay. You've got a purpose that God has established for you. That, that God has desired from you from long before you ever had the privilege to walk this earth. He's got something in mind for you. But it's not to be the potter. That's not our job. He's the potter. We're the clay. And if we're really going to be good clay, okay, we've got to appreciate a couple of things. The things that you and I call shattering, Lots of times God calls shaping. Many of you remember back in September, Spencer Perkins was um, shot and struggled with life for about eight days. Um, no, six days. And um, passed away after a long week at, at University Medical Center. Spencer was a junior at Heritage Academy. His, his identical brother, Sawyer, uh, will be in the senior class at Heritage. And it was a devastating occurrence for a lot of us. Um, anytime you, you have a young person who dies, um, it's painful. Anytime anybody you love dies, it's painful. But with a young person, it seems almost especially tragic. And, and, and just by the grace of God, I had the privilege to, to walk with a lot of the people in that school through that week and see the things that, that God was doing in their midst as they struggled and as they hurt and as they rebelled and as they, uh, you know, suffered. That's not too light a word. And I came to the realization that, that as I watched these kids do some amazingly incredible things, that they made a choice not to be shattered by this and easily could have. We had several students who, who were best friends with him. We had his identical twin brother who was there. It would have been very easy to just pretend like the world quit, to, quit existing. But instead, I, I watched God do some stuff through a, a large portion of these people that has really kind of made a profound impact on our community. I watched a senior class expand an already ambitious project that would have taken about $150,000 to complete and go out and raise another 80000 so that they could do it to the next level in memory of Spencer. I watched kids who were terrified to speak in front of a crowd stand up and share their testimony in front of every kid in that school. I watched people who, who had never prayed before out loud lead their friends to Jesus. I had the privilege to, to stand with a 7th grade group um, and, and this young boy, Michael, who, who's just a spitfire. Um, I mean, in the span of two minutes, I watched him discern what God was doing in their midst and he spoke to Mary Lexus and he just said, I think the Lord would want you to know that he wants all of you. And it was so tender to watch it because it wasn't obnoxious. It wasn't aggressive. It wasn't out of God's will. 
It was being perfect clay in the potter's hands. And Mary Lexus agreed wholeheartedly. And right there at the 20-yard line, before we went out with everybody else to pray, she kneeled and submitted her life to the Lord. The things that we call shattering, sometimes God calls shaping. And I've got to confess something too. I can't speak for you. But I know that I'm selfish. I know that I'm short-sighted. I know that I'm stubborn. I know that there are a lot of times that, that I am not all that I'm supposed to be. But I realize this, that, that if I want to look at things in God's economy appropriately, I don't need to do it in my own eyes. I don't need to do it by my own power. Because I could look at something at, and, and see it only as devastation or only as heartbreak or only as this or only as that. But in God's economy, I'm learning that God's not bound to my interpretation of how bad things are. When we went down to the, to, to the Gulf Coast after Katrina hit, um, we were down on, on Labor Day 2005, about six days after Katrina made landfall. Um, it was hard to function through that day if you just simply dwelled on all the devastation and all the pain and all of the brokenness and all of the disruption. It would have been paralyzing, I would be willing to bet, if that were simply what we focused on. But, but I had the joy to be there with, with ten guys who, instead of setting our eyes on what surrounded us, chose to, to be encouraged to fix our eyes on, on what God was accomplishing through our purposes. And, and in the midst of standing in a parking lot where there wasn't anything left but just, I mean, dirt. And most of that had been blown in from downriver. In the Black Bayou at, at Trinity United Methodist Church. Standing there watching people come from all over the city of Gulfport for a pork chop. I began to realize that my short-sightedness said all we're doing is going down here and trying to put a band-aid on a problem. But in God's economy, we were going down to be His hands and feet. And it was received as so much more than just a simple pork chop. It was just a pork chop in my mind, but to God's people and in God's economy, it was, they have not forgotten us. They have not abandoned us. They have not forsaken us. They have come to stand with us. I began to appreciate the difference between the way I view something and the way that God views something. It, it's not about my, my short-sightedness though or my self, um, my self-brokenness or, or my substandardness. I want you to appreciate that, that when we walk through this life, if we can walk with the eyes of the sovereignty of God that God is, that will help us to be clay yielded in the hands of the master potter. But because everything that happens in life, I believe, can be redeemed for God's glory. I believe that, that the, even the most tragic of circumstances that God can take and shake in the youth ministry world, what we say is God can take a crooked stick and hit a straight lick with it every time. Because I've seen it happen so many times that I'm convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that there is a huge element of truth to it. And, and so when we look through the sovereignty of God, instead of seeing a man who was struck blind, we see a disciple who offer, authored over half the New Testament. Instead of seeing Peter who fell after three steps on the water, we see Peter, the leader of the early church, boldly proclaiming the gospel of Christ in Acts chapter 2. And instead of seeing the, the countless number of saints who, who made huge and drastic contributions for the glory of God to this economy that we speak of, we see the millions 
of people who have since given their lives to Christ as a result of their faithfulness. If we focus on our selfishness or our short-sightedness or our self-centeredness, we will miss out on so many opportunities to observe the sovereignty of God in our midst. There's one last thing I'd want to bring to our attention because... I feel like it's something that, uh, that, that we need to appreciate. I don't say what I say today to, to say that you should feel convicted if you struggle with this. And instead, I would rather encourage you. Because I want you to appreciate the, the promises that God ha- has afforded us. Uh, rather than to dwell on the places where I may have blown it at some point in the past or where you may have blown it at some point in the past, I would so much rather just spend about four minutes sharing three promises that, that God has made for you and I that all stem out of our deep and abiding faith in God. Can we do that? Is that okay? Okay. If we have a, a deep and abiding faith in God, um, we can trust, number one, that he loves us. And I don't mean a little bit, and I don't mean half-heartedly. I mean he loves us with everything that he is and all that he can bring to the table. He loves us. And, and in John 16, we get this picture. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his arrest and for his trial and for his crucifixion and his resurrection and his ascension. And, and in one of the last opportunities he has with these men and women that he's preparing for, he he takes the time to just remind them that they could ask for anything they want in his name. And and they can they can ask for whatever it is, but they don't have to say, Jesus, go ask the Father on our behalf. What they have the privilege to do is to ask the Father on their own behalf. Not because they're good but because the Father loves us. We don't have to have an intermediary to the throne of God any longer. By the blood of Christ, He's paved a way for us to boldly approach and to declare, not out of of His pity for our brokenness, but out of His abounding love for us as sons and daughters. He loves us. Second thing I would encourage you to be reminding is that if we really have deep and abiding faith in God, then we can trust that He's in control. Um, and, and as we read through Romans 8, and the memory comes to mind where we begin to talk that we know that for those who God loves, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purposes. Um, and that 28th verse that, that so many people have read and memorized and used to encourage themselves and others around them. You know what? If we can really move beyond just knowing that passage to making application of that passage in our lives, if we could could quit worrying about jobs, (laughs) what we'll do next or not do next, Bills, relationships. Just a couple of examples from my own life. If I would spend less time worrying about those and more time becoming better clay, I'd be better served. Be better served. Finally, I I want to simply remind you that, that if we have a deep and abiding faith in God, then we can trust that he knows what's best. Because I'll be very frank, I have struggled with the decision to tender my resignation more this week than I've ever struggled with anything in my life. I I have wondered a thousand times, God, have have I been obedient? God, have I missed the mark? God, have I overstepped your bounds? God, am I acting in my flesh? God, God, God. Time and again, He's been very gracious to simply remind me by the power of His Holy Spirit 
that I don't have to walk according to my own wisdom anymore. But that He knows the plans He has for me. And His plans are, are good. His desire is to bless me and to bless my family and to bless this church. And that if I want to act in my flesh and stay put, even though I think it's a better fit, it denies the blessing He's got in store for me and a blessing He's got in store for us. And as painful as it has been to accept that as a reality, I believe it's a reality. I believe it's a reality. Not just like I believe it's a reality that God has something that He desires for you to experience in the midst of your life. I'm done. I went way too long and I'm real sorry. Um, but it's hard when you get one last chance to tell people you love how much you love them. Thank you for the privilege. And uh